You know, I think the big change that's happened over the last decade is when you talk about cloud companies, most people thought about technology companies like NetSuite or Salesforce.com or some of the other ones that you've heard of. But what I've discovered as I've started to talk to many of you and companies around the globe is that every company has figured out they are a cloud company. They have to figure out how to deliver their goods and services through this ubiquitous network. How do they transform their operations? How do they transform their offerings to reach customers in this world? And if you just think about some examples that you may not think apply to your world, but they really do. Look at what Amazon did. They completely obliterated booksellers, retailers, because they thought they used this new ubiquitous network to deliver products and goods more efficiently, right? They didn't have bricks and mortar stores. Amazon changed the game on everyone in that industry. They came out of nowhere. You think about media. The media world has also been fundamentally transformed from paper-based to non-paper-based. Another great example of how the cloud completely disrupted one of the world's largest entry, industries almost overnight. And I think this is a great example of showing you what, what, how the cloud actually works is it eliminates massive amounts of costs. So if you think about newsprint, I remember talking to a, uh, the publisher of, of Business Week. It said him, it cost him $5 to print Business Week. That was what his cost, his entire business model was built around that $5 cost. And then, of course, the cost to distribute it. The online guys have zero dollars of cost to distribute their news. How do you recover from that big a disruption in your entire, how your entire business is structured? And that's going to happen to all of your businesses as well. And finally, I think Groupon's the final great example of how you have to think about your business differently in terms of what offerings you're going to make. You know, you look at, you look at these print publications at the newspaper, especially the local newspaper business, right? They had relationships with all of us right in their neighborhood. But none of them came up with the idea to start offering us effectively Groupon-type offers with that database. That would have saved their companies. Took this new business, they said, forget it, we're going to do local offers to all of these companies. So if somebody at these local newspapers had figured out, hey, that's where the world is going, these are the new types of, I have to become a cloud company, these are the new types of offers I have to do, my classified business is going to go away, Groupon would never have happened. And so, your business is going to come under assault if it isn't already coming under assault by similar new types of business models. I don't care if you're a product company, if you're a service company, if you're a distributor, if you're a retailer, you may already be feeling it. You know, we talked a lot about retail here, but frankly, everybody's a retailer today. Your customers are all going to these sites, shopping. They're going to Amazon. Amazon gives them a great experience. They know who they are. They suggest them new offerings. They deliver the product very efficient, efficiently, on time, at low cost. And then if you happen to be a distributor or a manufacturer, they go to your website, and they're going to buy thousands of items, maybe millions of dollars of purchases, and you can't even recognize them on their site. Believe me, when they find somebody that does recognize them electronically and gives them an Amazon-like, Amazon.com-like experience to transact for 1,000 items and millions of dollars, that's where their business is going to go. And that's the simplest example. There's much more complex Groupon-type things that you have to think about your business. But think about what the consumer's mindset is today and you have to fundamentally start thinking about how you interact with those consumers, even in a B2B world. So what's happening in the internet across all industries is, certainly in the cloud, is you're seeing massive reductions in cost. And certainly that's what you see when you deploy NetSuite is you eliminate a lot of the cost of traditionally managing and upgrading applications as part of the service we provide. But more importantly, and I think you'll hear about this from the customers, what you really get when you move to NetSuite is a system designed to run a modern business. And the core feature of a system designed to run a modern business is how agile that system is, how quickly you can change your business system as your business conditions exist. The most amazing thing to me is when I look at folks using SAP or Microsoft or Sage or whatever, they've, they did an implementation 10 years ago when the world did exist, telephones, non-internet, and they haven't touched it since for fear that the whole thing's going to blow up, right? You customized it, you never want to touch it again. That's no way to run a modern business. You have to be able to change your business system as your business pressures change your business. And that's one of the, the beauties of NetSuite is how it makes your company more agile. You can change it on the fly. And we can talk a little bit technically about how it works. So let's talk a little bit about our evolution and how we got here. Because the, the big idea, as I said, was to design a system to run a business, 
deliver it over the internet, and allow you to conduct commerce anywhere. Those were the three ideas. But the real idea was to bring the power of large enterprise systems who had at least that architecture, the idea of having a common set of operational systems to run the business, bring that power down to the small and mid-sized market. Because we, we saw and we continue to see, it's as hard to run a small and medium business as it is to run a large business. In fact, in, in many ways, it's harder. You know, you make a $100,000 mistake, you might be out of business. I made million dollar mistakes in my career and I got promoted in large companies, right? So completely different. So you need that power, but you need it in a way that's easy to consume and much lower price. And we heard a lot from Mark about the problem of just e-commerce enabling things was integration. Really the problem of running your business today is integration. This is what I call the hairball. This is how almost all of you run your business, right? You went and bought applications by department. You bought an accounting application, and they said, oh, I need a warehouse application. Oh, I need an HR system. Oh, now I have to bolt on e-commerce. So you went and bought supposed best of breed applications, and then you realized, oh, no, all this data has to go between all of these systems. And so you tried to tie them together. It never worked. This was the house of cards that really Evan and Larry, this picture is what Evan and Larry tried to, to solve, was say, let's build a single system. Let's build a single data model around which everyone in our company can transact build the ERP system first, but make sure we add commerce, CRM to those applications. Second big problem we solved was, so if you've got everybody in your company operating on the system, how do you make that application look differently when a CEO is logging in versus a head of sales versus the website manager? So you had to have a role-based view with different KPIs, different functionality depending on login. And last but not least, this was that last thing that Larry said to Evan, make sure you can take transactions on the internet very early on, we discovered instead of making that application look like a business application, like what a CFO or what a warehouse manager might say, we, we said, well, could, couldn't we just, instead of having a business UI, couldn't we just let our customers put their website directly on top of the operational system? Because that's, what the, that's the UI of the customer. Whether you're selling to partners or suppliers or consumers, they want to see a website. Lo and behold, we could. And this is really the power of building an integrated system versus integrating a system, right, which is what Mark talked about. It's impossible to integrate applications that weren't designed to work together. You've all tried it. And the most amazing thing is I know Microsoft was outside handing out candy or something. And you know you've really made it when Microsoft is trying to raid your events. But so let me use Microsoft as an example. They have ERP applications and they have CRM applications. They tell you they can't make them work together. And then it's amazing, all the IT people in the audience, oh, Microsoft, you're the world's largest software company. You can't solve that problem, but I'll solve it. I can make them work together. And you spend hours trying to, it, it can't. So and it's not to say Microsoft doesn't have OK software. I mean, I might say that. But it is, it is to say applications that weren't designed to work together don't work together. That's fundamentally what's going on here. We didn't design multiple applications. We call it an integrated suite. We designed a single thing. It is a single data model. It is, there aren't multiple schemas. It's a single thing around which everyone transacts. So calling it an integrated system is a little bit of a misnomer. It's a single application. That's how we solve the problem. Very complex problem to solve. Um, no, and nobody else has been able to solve it since. Another competitor, SAP, some of you may know, they tried to copy this in 2007. They called that product business by design. They just killed that product last week. So when the world's largest ERP provider can't figure out how to solve this problem, it's a very hard problem to solve that we have managed to solve. So that was great for the early history of our company, solving the problem for small and mid-sized businesses. A funny thing happened on the way to solving that. Large enterprises decided they wanted some of that too. And while we brought the power of large enterprise systems down to small sizes, small companies, what large enterprises are now getting is the agility of this system, the ability to to implement in months, not years, decades, as one example. And so when you run a multinational company, in fact, many of you as small and mid-sized businesses have this problem, but we're sort of setting it up as if you're a toll, for example. You have the hairball on steroids. You have many, many companies running. And guess what? You have to build a hairball per company. Your hairball in Singapore has to run on some funky accounting system. They need their own CRM system. Your hairball in Japan needs ya, on and on and on. And of course, you're the CEO of that company. You want to see all this stuff consolidated, right? So try to solve this problem. Let's consolidate into regions, currencies, everything about that business. Let's solve it, uh, uh, consolidate into headquarters. When you hear people saying, I've spent 100 million Australian dollars trying to solve this problem, this is the problem they're trying to solve. It is an unsolvable problem. 
Because you, if you think it's hard to put five applications together, try putting 105 applications together in a meaningful way. And so the challenge is, a lot of software vendors will come up here and say, it's easy to integrate my application. And this is what happened in this generation, right? Siebel said, hey, it's easy to integrate Siebel with SAP. I've got an API. Well, OK, it's complicated. You can program it to have the applications tied together. The problem is synchronizing the data is very, even if you've connected them, is almost impossible. When you have data in two systems, it's wrong in one place. You just don't know which place it's wrong in. And so what do you do? You trust the accounting system because you bill out of that. So on a multinational level, you will never solve this problem in a meaningful way. In fact, speaking of SAP, they can't solve this problem. How do people do consolidation in SAP? They use a product called Hyperion. They can't figure, if it's all SAP, they can't figure out how to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And that's really what it's all about, is putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. You cannot do it. So over the last two years, back in 2008, we introduced a solution to this problem. It's gonna, it, and that is, when you, when you, Humpty Dumpty never gets broken up, as in the NetSuite model, it becomes very simple to solve that problem. You let your Australian subsidiary look at their particular slice of the database in Australian dollars and local tax. You let your UK sub look at it in pounds and VAT. You let Singapore look at it in their currency. You let China look at it in their currency and their language. But because it's in a sim single place, suddenly you can consolidate it and look at it in any way that you would like to see it. So One World is the product that solves this problem for multinationals. Local control over currency, quota, tax, all of the things that you want to give control locally, but then global consolidation across those and global visibility. And we'll talk a little bit about that. You can suddenly see what's going on in China now. Wouldn't that be nice to know what the heck's happening in China uh, with your company, with the dollars, all of those things? Because it's a web-based application, you can suddenly manage that remotely. So 19 languages, 190 currencies, incredible product um, for multinationals. So these are sort of the, the base level uh, capabilities of NetSuite that have transformed the cloud and ERP for many of our customers. Lots of great benefits from that particular piece of the world. Now, so that's how you run your business. But what's going on in the world, this, this, they put this graphic together, it's too complicated even for me to describe, right? You've got suppliers all over the world, you have people buying all over the world. How do you now manage that world? And I think the challenges in today's world from that picture are really summarized by three things. The customer experience is king, B2C, B2B, they have a very different expectation because of Amazon, eBay, the local website, uh, Apple. Apple's another great example, right? Apple has totally messed it up for all of us because I go online, I buy something at iTunes, and then I go in store, and they actually recognize who I am. How the heck did they do this? They built something like NetSuite, a single system that says, online, make it look like this, and in store, make it look like this. But it's one customer record. That's the, that's where, that customer experience is what you all have to get to. And you can't get to a single customer record if you have eight customer records, if you have the hairball. And that's what's happened in retail and all these various channels. Second thing is multiple business models are the norm. You'll see companies selling B2C, right? They sell directly to consumers. You sell them, see them selling B2B. They may have distributors or selling through retailers, right? How do you deal with that business model? And then you see all sorts of funky variations after that. B to B to C, right? Sell to distributors, sell to consumers. There's all of these new, new ways of conducting business. How are you gonna, are you gonna build a hairball for each business model as well as each consumer touch point? Never gonna work. Um, and then finally, and you talk, and this was interesting, hearing about social commerce being the next trend over five years, you don't know what's next. You don't know what device is next. You don't know what the consumer experience has to be. How do you future-proof your systems? How do you get a commerce engine that allows you to suddenly display and have an interaction with your customer in a way that you cannot predict? These are the challenges, I think, that you're facing today. And so here's the world that we're living in in each of those business models. Business to consumer, it used to just be the website. Now they're doing things on phones. They're conducting business on Facebook. Um, you have point of sale. Retail's not dead, right? 95% of all commerce is still done at the store. How do you make your e-tail channels and your retail channels work together? Um, so the answer has been, let's build a different hairball for each, each touch point. We'll have my, our, our iPhone hairball, our point of sale hairball, never gonna work. You need a common backend to feed all of these different UIs. Business to business, you're all gonna have this business model. Same problem. You're gonna to wanna to sell to resellers. You're gonna to wanna to sell to, to, to retailers. Heck, if you're a manufacturer, maybe you're gonna experiment with going direct. 
right? That's probably one of the big challenges in manufacturing is maybe I'm going to go around my distribution channel. How do I do that? And you're also going to interact with your suppliers. You know, I thought that was an interesting slide where he said not only are we selling things online, but how many of you are ordering things from suppliers online? What's, what should that experience be like? And frankly, what's happening is B2B purchasers want an experience that's as compelling as the B2C experience. They, when they come to your website, and we talked about this, we'll talk about it uh, with Biopack, I said, are you currently using our existing customer center, our old customer center? Our old, our old customer center is not that attractive, let's be honest. He said, no, because that's not the image I want to portray. We have a new customer center, by the way, so that's super, he's deploying that right now. He wants an experience as, as, as exciting for a B2B customer as it is for a B2C customer. And believe me, you all do too. So how are you going to solve that problem? You're going to build different hairball per channel? I don't think so. And then finally, the other thing that's coming to a machine near you, and frankly, this is kind of what it's about, is machine-to-machine -machine commerce. The machine is going to become the salesperson, and it's actually going to sell to other machines. And, you know, I got this, I, I realized this when I got in a new car, I hadn't bought one in a while, and it had five television screens in it. I'm like, hmm, I think they're going to sell me something over this. I think they're going to tell me when my wipers are done, I think they're going to tell me when I need servicing, they're going to tell me how close. The machine is going to start communicating to other machines and then to me. We have a customer, Intuitive Surgical, that does robots. Every time they do a medical procedure, they burn through an inventory item, whatever sort of sterile pack they use to do this procedure or that procedure. Why doesn't the machine know how many items they have in inventory, how many sterile reusables they have, and when they get to half of it, it calls the NetSuite machine at Intuitive Surgical and says, send me another 50 of those because I'm going to need them in two weeks. So software companies already do this. The machine says your software is out of date. It's time for you to renew, pay now. Uh, the classic refrigerator, you're out of beer, want me to order some and have it drop shipped to you. Um, and finally, the you know, absurd example, the electric toothbrush. You're all supposed to change your bristles every, every two months. None of us do it. Believe me, that thing's going to have a chip in it. It's going to be network aware, and it's just going to order you some new bristles when it's time. So everything is going to be embedded with network capabilities and CPU and knowledge about you, and we'll be able to do things on your behalf. So, and if you're a manufacturer, actually, you're starting to look at how you build this service capability into your products. So you see here this with GE. GE's doing it in aircraft engines. They know when the blade's, done, the blade's damaged, the blade calls home, tells the server, tech, server technician to replace the blade. All of your things that you're manufacturing are going to be built for service in this sense. So how are you going to solve this problem? Are you going to build a hairball per machine? I don't think so. And so when we went about re-architecting the original version of NetSuite that Larry and Evan first sat down and talked about, and said, let's make sure they can take website transactions, the architecture we originally created was good for smaller businesses. But the front-end display capability was tightly coupled with the back-end. So in the old NetSuite world, you had, for example, you had to use a three-step checkout to check out. Well, not everybody wants, some people want to do a one-step checkout, some people want to do a 10-step checkout. You really couldn't decouple them. So we set out re-architecting the product for front-end, disconnected from the back-end in the sense of being able to control every pixel, but also anticipating that we could never tell what the end-user device was going to be that you had to display your core business and customer data through. So we created basically NetSuite as a headless commerce engine that you could put any head on that you wanted to. You could put a toothbrush head on it. You could put a phone head on it. You could put a website head on it. But behind it all, like Apple, is a single system that recognizes the customer attributes in each of those front ends. And that's the thing today that we call sweet commerce. Single back end, any head that you want to put on it. Um, and so the great thing about this is it's not just about, again, front facing, it's about how you're going to buy things, how, how your vendors are going to buy from you, as well as how you're going to sell via the front end. You, can, you now have a, a wrapper around NetSuite that you can deliver any customer experience you want on the buy side, and what most people focus on is on the sell side, but the buy side is becoming equally important. So great example of this, just launched in Australia, hopefully many of you have shopped there, William Sonoma, huge retailer in the US, $4 billion. Um, eight big brands, 581 stores in the U.S. Their growth strategy was to go outside the U.S. now. And actually, the first market they chose was yours. And so John Strain, who's a CIO there, big-time e-commerce guy, looked at his existing infrastructure, which had been built over 10 years. And he said, am I going to take this hairball, this older, it works, it's great technology, am I going to take this and am I going to be able to roll it out in 
Australia, Thailand, UK, all of these different countries in a very short period of time? The answer was no. We, get, we want to get out in four months. And so what they did was they chose NetSuite, amazingly, after, you know, this is, this is a big bet these guys made. Um, and they're doing exactly what I showed you up there. I don't know if you've been to their stores. They have four big brands. These are well-known in the U.S. They may not be as well-known here. Um, Pottery Barn, Pottery Barn Kids, West Elm, and Williams-Sonoma. In so they, they're running, so these are all the, effectively all the UIs they're running out of their core NetSuite system. The e-commerce site, the point of sale system, for each of the different brands, each of the different store locations, and there's one more we have to put on there, they're also doing call center as the customer facing piece. Those are all the different front ends to this common system. On the back end, they're doing all the procurement, they're doing logistics, they're doing reconciliation and financials out of that same system. All of that's happening in Singapore while the selling's happen, happening here. And much of this is being managed from the US, how the system actually works. This is how they went to Australia, and didn't take them three decades, didn't take them three years. They effectively rolled out the front end of this in three months. Multi-billion dollar retailer going live, multi-channel commerce, the buzzword of the century in three months. So hopefully you've all been shopping there, check it out. Another one, so we talked a little bit about the new experience uh, the front end, we actually launched the first, the first company to launch with this new sweet commerce front end, we, the, we're front end and back end here if you think about it, was Wine Market, winemarket.com.au, another Australian company. So it's funny, when we came here two or three years ago, all the customers we spoke to and analysts said, oh, we're so far behind in e-commerce. Australia has amazingly caught up, most of it on NetSuite, frankly. But this is the website, this is actually it. They sell great booze to the same people with a brand new website. This is their their new site that they went live with. And the cool thing is, it's, it's multi-UI. So here's, I actually have it here. This is their iPod, uh, iPad version, and this is the kind of stuff that you get. Automatic resizing, this is called responsive design. You design it once, it resizes for whatever form factor. If you call it up on your phone, it'll even shrink further. So you wanna know what their ERP system looks like? This is what their ERP system looks like. There's nothing sitting between this and their core transactional system. Okay, so pretty amazing, first, a first here in Australia. A first in the world, really. I don't know if wine market's here, actually. Hopefully we're, we're ser ser serving their great booze to some new people. Other companies deploying this here, Elders, this is very interesting. Talk about sort of uh, rethinking your business model. For those of you that are familiar with Elders, they're the big agri agricultural supply company, largest in Australia, multi-billion dollar company. They actually created a new brand to basically disrupt themselves. This is their online brand now, AgSure. So instead of letting somebody else group on them, they're group on themselves. And oh, by the way, when you order on AgSure, you can now suddenly pick up in the Elder Store out in Western Australia or wherever you happen to be ranching. So buy online, pick up in store, all in that suite. This is what their ERP system looks like. So you have to really rethink what you're doing when you're talking about operational systems in the modern world. So those are some great examples of companies that have already deployed this. I wanted to give you a little more a deeper view of how the system looks when you're operating the system from an internal perspective, what's the business application look like, and what's the experience look like externally. This is going to be a retailer, but again, I think we're all retailers now, so, so don't, get, don't say I'm not a retailer. These are the experiences that you're going to have to deliver to all of your customers. So with that, let me uh, bring up uh, Sanjay Nathu. Sanjay, take it away. That's the way we say it in America. <laughs> All right, so it's um, great to be up here again um, this year. So today what I'm going to do is spend about 10 or 15 minutes with you guys walking you through how a company can use NetSuite to manage their global omnichannel business. In order to get things started, what I wanted to do was introduce you to a company called Generation N. Generation N were a fictitious company that we made up at NetSuite that launched in 2012 as a retail of apparel for both men and women. Generation N used NetSuite to power all of their back office operations, but when they launched their business back in 2012, they had two, four retail stores, two in Melbourne and two in Sydney, again using NetSuite point of sale but also using NetSuite to manage their back office functions, such as marketing, inventory, and as well as financials. 
as the business grew, Generation N then launched their e-commerce website using Sweet Commerce. Again, Sweet Commerce, as Zach's been talking about, with its, res with its responsive design, gave Gen um, Generation N a fantastic looking e-commerce website that was de delivered across multiple devices. They were able to have their customers buying online, picking up in store through NetSuite point of sale, as well as the un unexpected event was that as, oh, sorry, my mouse is going a little bit crazy there. As customers, as they launched their e-commerce site, they suddenly found that they expanded their market. They weren't only selling to customers in Australia anymore, but their products were being picked, packed, and shipped through, all, through countries all around the world. Some of their deliveries were being run through to countries like the United States, United Kingdom, Brazil, South Africa, and um, Singapore. What this meant, though, was no matter where the customer shopped, NetSuite, through its One World engine, automatically calculated tax rules for them, as well as the correct shipping rates. Generation N also then decided to go ahead and further enhance their business through 2013. They no longer decided to only be a retailer, but they decided to change their business model. They changed from still maintaining being a retailer through their retail outlets, but started manufacturing their own products, and once again turned to NetSuite to manage the manufacturing process, but again looked at different channels for expanding their business model. They also became a wholesaler of their product, and now we're looking through their wholesale channels to be able to go ahead and sell their product as well. So let's have a look at where Generation N have ended up today. They still have their stores in Australia, through Melbourne and Sydney, but in our fictitious world here, they've also gone ahead and opened up stores throughout the United States and the United Kingdom and, and Singapore. Again, all powered by NetSuite One World. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do today, though, is spend a couple of minutes walking you through three separate areas of the Generation N business. We'll first go ahead and, and log in as the purchasing manufacturing manager and I'll get, give you guys a little bit of a feel of how our purchasing manager uses NetSuite to manage his global inventory business, as well as his manufacturing business. We'll then go ahead and look through an e-commerce shopping experience of our, of our demo customer, Hugh, who's got a, a, some loyalty points to spend. And lastly, we'll go ahead and, and wrap up the day by looking at the CEO's dashboard and how our CEO uses NetSuite to manage his global business. So going ahead and logging into NetSuite, the, the, the NetSuite application, one of the things that you'll notice is that and let me scroll up so you guys can see the top of the page there. There we go. Um, what you'll notice is that our application is all web, web de delivered. So our, our users can access the system from anywhere in the world. On our purchasing and inventory manager's dashboard, the first thing that he's really looking at when he walks in is his key performance indicators. Some of his KPIs that he uses to manage the business, uh, looking at his inventory levels, as well as from a manufacturing point of view, looking at what the current work orders that, that are outstanding are. He's also got instant visibility into the current open purchase orders, as well as the value of those purchase orders running through the business. From his warehouse manager's workbench, and sorry, I've clicked one step too far there, um, he's also got access through to being able to go ahead and get quick access into the system of being able to get into master data, into his demand planning modules, as well as his manufacturing modules. He's also got access straight away into the store, store metrics and how store sales are going across these multiple retail stores. And what you'll see is that he's got real-time visibility into store sales across the world, across the Australian stores as well as his US stores, and if we so wanted, his, his UK-based stores. Through the, through the metrics, though, he's also able to go ahead and see his sales, the margin at each individual store, as well as the sales per square meter, and being able to KPI himself ar around those sales per, um, sales per square meter. And the last thing that's really important to him is to be able to go ahead and monitor what his current back orders are. So the new range of backpacks that Generation N have gone and, and manufactured um, are already sitting on back order, and he's got 20 of his Salida blue backpacks on back order that he's now really interested in going ahead and actually investigating what's going on with these backpacks. So what we'll do next is drill down into our backpack and actually go ahead and have a look at what the components of that backpack are, as well as how our manager goes ahead about using them. So going ahead into our inventory uh, master item, and one of the core things that I'll also just pause for a second here to point out is that we've got a single inventory item across all of NetSuite. So whether we're looking at it from our purchasing point of view, our manufacturing point of view, or our web store point of view, it is still a single inventory item. So we're not talking about having multiple disconnected systems trying to connect them back to master data. It is all just a single master data record. So from our, from our master inventory item for our Salida backpack, our purchasing manager's got access into being able to see his quantity on hand across all of the locations, as well as what the quantity um, currently on work order is. So what's currently being manufactured in his Australian warehouse. He's got access to being able to see reorder points, as well as um, the maximum uh, or the stored preferred levels, as well as the inventory value across each of these locations. So he's got real-time visibility to be able to get information to what inf inventory is sitting throughout his distribution channel. Over on his manufacturing tab, NetSuite gives him the ability to go ahead and see all the various components that go into the backpack. 
with the, with the various components, you can go ahead and also track revisions of, these, um, of the various um, iterations the backpack goes through. So you'll notice that we've got a couple of different iterations there really revolving around the zippers um, and the buttons that we're using on our backpack. But NetSuite gives, um, gives our manufacturing manager the ability to track all those various revisions. We also are able to go ahead and track the manufacturing route plans. So as this backpack gets made in the, in the warehouse, we can track the various steps that it goes through. So our manufacturing process is all again, once again, tracked inside NetSuite. One of the most important tabs within, within the, the inventory master record is our sales tab. And what you'll notice is that NetSuite is managing a very complex and very, um, very much of a matrix of our item pricing. Firstly, we've got pricing going across the, across the screen in multiple currencies. So no matter where our customer is shopping on our e-commerce site, based on which location they're in, we can then start delivering their pricing in various countries. And we're not relying on live exchange rates for that. It can actually be a US dollar-based price. We've then also got the ability to have multiple price lists. And again, talking back to that single system, is that we can have this one price list running through our retail stores going through to point of sale, through our e-commerce channels, as well as through our wholesale pricing is all set up from a single inventory record and making the business run much more efficiently. You'll also go ahead and notice that we've got quantity breaks in here. So we can do quantity-based pricing. So buy three of our backpacks and you get a, a reduced price. And that can then automatically flow through all of the, all of the various channels. So moving across into our web store tab, again, coming back to that single inventory record, is within this one record, we can go ahead and choose to publish this item out into our e-commerce site, choose which inventory um, pictures we want to use or display thumbnails, as well as going ahead and selecting our full web store description. We could, of course, go ahead and categorize it down to which um, categories it lives in and publish all that information, but again, coming back to that single inventory record. And lastly, over on the Suite Social tab, one of NetSuite's newest products, is that it gives the, the users at Generation in a very collaborative experience where they can go ahead and actually talk about what's going on with the manufacturer of this product. So Suite Social enables the users to talk about it from both an inventory level, but any record within NetSuite. So we can have a chat session going on around a customer or even around um, any individual transaction, even a sales order. In my example here, you'll notice that I've gone ahead and said that we're having some problems with our backpack. And Matt Panica, one of our product development managers, has come along and said that he's resolved the issue by placing an order for some new zippers and buttons. And it really gives the, the team members within Generation N the ability to collaborate around this. Now that we've had a quick look through the purchasing and manufacturing role, what I do want to go ahead and do next is walk through an e-commerce role. So from, from, the, from an user's, end user's perspective, Net, um, Generation N once again turned to NetSuite to be their loyalty management program. So as customers went ahead and ordered um, products with Generation N, be it from their e-commerce site or from their in-store, these customers went ahead and earned loyalty points. As the customers accrued enough loyalty points, uh, um, gift vouchers were automatically emailed out to our customers. So my customer here, he has um, received an email from Generation N saying that he's got a $50 gift voucher that he's allowed to spend through all the loyalty points that he's earned through his purchases both in-store and online. Going ahead and choosing to say that he wants to go ahead and shop for with his $50, he straight away navigates his way into the Generation N website, a website that's been developed with the responsive design of Sweet Commerce. As he goes ahead and scrolls down the bottom of the page, he suddenly notices that there are some new product arrivals but what Hugh doesn't know is that these products have actually been hand-delivered to him by the Sweet Commerce engine and the content delivery engine in the background knows that Hugh is a male and that he, through his previous purchases, he may be interested in backpacks. So that dynamic content is delivered to him automatically by the system. Going ahead and going into the shop all category, he can flip through the multiple product pages. And the one thing I'd point out is the speed at which these websites load. And that's really through, through to the content delivery network that sits behind NetSuite's Sweet Commerce engine. Knowing that Hugh is actually after a backpack, he chooses to say he could um, potentially search for the product by name, but in our case here, he's going to use the faceted navigation on the left-hand side and select the category of gear, which then goes in and refines the list of the type of products that he can go ahead and shop for. So really enabling Hugh to go and shop for his products really quickly and efficiently. Now, Hugh's actually had his eye on this Alita backpack that he viewed in store a couple of weeks ago, and he's going to go ahead and simply go ahead and choose to add that into his shopping cart. He's got the ability to choose between multiple colors as, Met as NetSuite goes ahead and manages matrix items, but he's going to go ahead and choose to add the blue, the blue backpack into his shopping cart and comes ahead into his um, shopping cart page and happy with all the items proceeds to the NetSuite one-page uh, one checkout. Now, within the one-page checkout, it makes it really easy for Hugh to go ahead and complete his order. He's got a couple of quick options to select from. Firstly, through his delivery address details, which he's got stored within NetSuite. And in our case here, yeah, he's going to go ahead and view the various addresses that he's got between his Melbourne agency and his Singapore-based agency. But knowing that if he chose Singapore, NetSuite One World would automatically go ahead and calculate the GST correctly for an export product. 
He's got the ability to go ahead and select between multiple delivery methods, between Australia Post eParcel, eParcel Express, or even the ability to select that he would like to pick this product up in store. And NetSuite would then go ahead and select or display the local stores to him. From the credit card information, again, he's got two different credit cards stored within NetSuite. Again, he's very happy to have the credit cards stored inside the system because he knows NetSuite is a PCI compliance system and his details will be stored securely for him. Also very happy that his payments will be processed by eWay, who is up the back of the room. Um, he also feels once again very secure that his tr um, transaction will be completed very securely. He then goes ahead and adds his gift card into the, into the transaction, um, seeing his gift certificate being applied against his order and is now once again happy to complete his order. All done very quickly, very seamlessly, but all tying back to a single NetSuite back office solution. Coming through to his order confirmation, once again does a quick check of his order, and would now like to, he'd now like to go ahead and have, have a look into the My Account area, the new customer center that Zach was talking about. From the My Account area, he has got very quick access into his recent orders, what the status of those orders are, as well as being, a, being able to go ahead and view the order details behind them. He can go ahead and view his profile information, um, the shipping information, or his default, his default delivery information, as well as his payment information and his default credit card. Over on the left-hand side, he could go ahead and choose to use, um, update his email preferences in terms of which subscriptions he'd like to subscribe to, whether it be marketing or billing information, whether he'd like to reorder some items that he's previously ordered, or whether he'd actually like to view his loyalty points and redeem those loyalty points for further gift vouchers. So the shopping experience is really fantastic and really easy for Hugh to go ahead and complete. Now that we've had a look through the second stage of our demo, sort of wrapping up, what I wanted to go through and do is walk you through the CEO's dashboard and how our CEO utilizes NetSuite to manage his global omnichannel business. So jumping back into the NetSuite back office solution, is we're then presented with our CEO's dashboard. So our CEO's dashboard, again, what you'll notice, looks very different to what our purchasing and manufacturing manager's dashboard looks like. Firstly, he's got his KPIs in terms of his sales, and again, the business is doing fantastically well, 99% um, up on sales versus last month, so no one can complain there. He's also keeping an eye on what his wholesale sales are. So again, being able to track sales across the multiple channels of the business as the business has changed from being a retailer to being a retailer and a wholesaler, he wants to keep an eye on the wholesale sales. Some of his other KPIs that are sitting in there is things like accounts payable, expenses, as well as his new customers' KPIs. Allowing, and NetSuite allows him to draw KPIs from anywhere within the system. The other thing that he also always wants to keep his eye on, again, going back to that multi-channel approach, is keeping an eye on his revenue across the multiple channels. So he's decided to put a, a report onto his dashboard showing his sales by each individual channel. And one of the last things that our CEO is always really, really worried about and really concerned about monitoring and managing is his VIP customers. So he's decided to put a, KPI, a report onto his dashboard of his VIP customer sales. So seeing Hughes place a, a couple of orders and spend $6,000 with us, our CEO is really interested to go ahead and have a look at what, what is it that Hughes is buying and walk through his customer profile. So jumping into our customer profile, our CEO has got really quick access into the lifetime value of Hugh and what he spent with us, what's his, prof, what's his current profit, as well as his total loyalty points that he's got. Down the bottom, through his transactions, we were able to see what transactions he had placed, but also from the items purchase tab, we can go ahead and see all the, all the individual items that Hugh's actually gone ahead and placed and ordered from, um, from Generation N. Through the other tabs across here, and again, tying back to a single system to manage all of your business, our CEO would be able to draw, drill down into the loyalty program and see the loyalty points that Hugh, Grant, um, Hugh Jackman has earned, looking at our marketing capabilities, so being able to see all the email blasts that actually went out to Hugh, and through the financial tab, also then going ahead and being able to see any credit card information, but if he was a B2B customer, any outstanding orders or outstanding balance. And lastly, as I was talking to earlier, we've also got the Sweet Social tab. So now knowing that we've got Hugh as a customer, we could go into Sweet Social and actually have an internal chat around what's going on with Hugh. So the last thing I'd like to introduce is our CEO recently started using some advanced um, business intelligence um, reports from uh, one of NetSuite's partners, Burst BI. And on his Burst BI dashboard, He's now got some um, even more detailed um, dashboards looking at the revenue trends, year-on-year um, -year growth, as well as the year-on-year -year growth percentages. He's able to go ahead and look at his revenue by touch point and actually being able to drill down into the revenue coming in by online tablet sales versus in-store sales uh, versus any other channel through the business. He's got reporting, again, delivered in terms of sales per, per month as compared to, to last year and being able to go ahead and, and track the trending of those various sales. The next tab over that I'd sort of like to walk you guys through is on the store performance dashboard. From the store performance, our CEO is able to go ahead and drill down into sales at each individual state and also have different color coding to show which states are profitable versus unprofitable or more profitable. 
and he can go ahead and configure how he wants those color schemes to work and how he wants, those, um, how he wants them to be alerted. At an individual store level, again, he's got global visibility into the sales across all of his stores in Australia, but he's also got the ability of drilling down into what sales are happening at each individual category at that store. And the last thing that he, our CEO wanted to be able to monitor was his sales by each individual product category across all of the Australian states. So he could see where the sales growth and, and um, shrinkage is happening across these various product categories. So having all this information readily available to him in real time, our CEO, our CEO is able to manage his global business in a really effective way, knowing that NetSuite is helping him manage his global omnichannel business. I hope you guys have enjoyed today's product presentation, and I'll hand back over to Zach. Great job. So, so just to be clear on what you saw there, I mean, it was f back, at, back in the early days when we started to do e-commerce as a part of our ERP offering, I, I talked to Larry Ellison one day, I said, Larry, after about 20 minutes, this is, you're talking 2003, 2004, after about 20 minutes, I, I can convince the customer that we can do ERP in the cloud, and they should be safe with it. Another 20 minutes, I can convince them that we can do their CRM as well, because the ERP data is actually the most important CRM data, et cetera, and so I can convince them of that. And then I say, we can also do all of your e-commerce, and they kick me out of the, the room because they think I'm a crazed salesperson. You know, how do I get over this? And he said, well, Zach, the, the thing that, that most customers don't understand is once you eliminate the problem of integration, right, getting the data in one place, solving all these really complicated problems like visualizing your data as a dashboard or displaying it as a web, it just simply become a display issue, right? If you think about what you saw there with the Hugh Jackman, when Hugh Jackman was in the customer center looking at his profile, what he bought, uh, how it was shipped to him, that was just a different view of the customer record that Sanjay showed you at the end from an internal view, which had all the item numbers and the parts lists. So once you stop fragmenting your data, Solving these problems becomes much, become much simpler because they simply become display issues. Now, we've obviously built incredible display engines to make this not just an okay display, but world-class display. In fact, we think in many ways it's better than the traditional solutions that only do display. If you think about Magento and Demandware and these types of solutions, it's funny, they call them e-commerce systems, except they can't do commerce. They can do the e part, but the transaction part, the ordering part, the shipping part, they have none of that capability. The multinational part, multi-tax, that's all got to come from a system like NetSuite. So we've really put together the best of both worlds here. This incredibly powerful display engine that you can make your data look any way you want to, any way that's appropriate for your end user consumer to consume it with this incredibly rich multinational backend. So, um, you know, and this, this isn't a trivial thing to do. You know, we've been in this business 15 years. This is the result of 15 years of executing on a single strategy of building a system to run a business and delivering it over the internet.